Hello, everybody, and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to our illustrious gathering. The College of Complexes consists of the following uh, three uh, parts. We're going to have a brief introduction, a brief announcements period for upcoming programs and any other interests, uh, things to the community. The second part will be our speaker who will be able to speak up to about an hour or so. And then we'll have our questions and answers. Questions must be in a form of a question and not a, a speech because after the question and answer period, you'll have a chance to rebut the speaker with a certain specified amount of time, depending on how many and how long we go. It could anywhere between three and five minutes. Uh, you'll get a chance about 7.45. We gotta wrap things up because the restaurant closes about eight o'clock. My name's Tim, I'm gonna be hosting the Zoom process tonight. And uh, if you give me uh, 30, 10 or 15 seconds, we'll have Charlie start up and give us the uh, upcoming programs. We have made a lot of changes to our schedule. I have some updated printed ones here for you. And Charlie will be going them over to the website in a second. <laughs> Okay, uh, Charlie, if you're ready, let's get this announcement. Let's get this uh, uh, upcoming program started. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,772 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. We have two basic rules at the College of Complexes, one of which is no full at a, one full at a time. Don't interrupt the speaker. And the second one are no personal attacks. And okay. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for upcoming programs. There's been one or two changes in the schedule, not major ones, adjustments in order to accommodate speakers. We have 10 upcoming programs on a variety of topics, looking pretty good for a summer session. Anyhow, um, on June, June 29th, our own Mike Lehman will be talking about uh, his trip. He's involved in railroad and rail transportation issues, high-speed bullet trains. And he took a trip to Europe, and specifically Germany, and he'll be reporting on ICE, ICE, the Inner City Express, which is the high-speed rail network of Germany, one of the first ones out there, the Siemens diesels and things like that, forefront product company producing diesels. Okay, all aboard June 29th. Transitioning into July the 6th, yours truly, Charles Paydock, will be our special Independence Day speaker, and I put together a program of 25 mistakes our country has made in its history. These are ones you may not have thought of, but 25 mistakes, and I offered 25 solutions. This will be followed by Peter Pirro, longtime college member, uh, who says America does wonderful things. So listen to what he's got to say. It's a, what a new format called Point it's Counterpoint. Good. Point, counterpoint. On July 13th, we're presently open. If you have a speech ready to go, please let me know. I Otherwise, I think we'll go with an open mic. It's been a while since we've had one, and I think there's a lot of issues we can cover. That's July 13th. On July 20th, the gentleman that will be talking about renewable green energy. He has believed that has not failed, has not, has not succeeded, in meeting the energy needs of our nation in various respects. So we'll be looking at green energy accomplishments. Are they authentic or not? That's on the July the 20th. On the 27th, uh, we'll be looking at uh, adopting the gentleman is here tonight. He's an author, very good book, available online, by the way, at our website. Uh, he's got a Q&A as well. Uh, Mr. Moon is going to be talking about uh, a new social contract for the people of the United States. 
the current one is not working uh, adequately, he maintains, and he's got plans for a new one. On August the 3rd, uh, Tom Moldano, young Tom Moldano, will be talking, returning, and he's got some methods and tips for improving your mind. This should be a must a program for everyone at the college. How to improve your mind. On August the 10th, we've got, this, we're in election year, so we're going to welcome Mike Rice from the 8th District. Uh, he's going to tell us about his plans uh, if elected to Congress from, from the 8th District, uh, which is surrounding Chicago. On the following week, we're going to have another candidate uh, for, for Congress, Chad Copy. Chad is a little bit different, however. He's a farmer a full, by full-time occupation, and I think we're going to focus on food policy, uh, uh, food processing, uh, the farm bill, and things like that. So we'll more from a rural perspective on August the 17th, if you're rural, interested in downstate issues, and in particular, uh, the food production and farming, uh, mega farms, things like that. Should have a wide range of views. On August the 24th, a very good organization will be proud to welcome HOME. It's a one of a kind organization that fosters independence and has a whole range of programs to benefit the senior citizen community. I believe their basic base is in the Little Brothers for the Poor, uh, if I trace their histories. Anyhow, this is one I think everyone should like to attend. August the 31st is presently open. Please supply a title and a written description, and we'll see if you're ready to go or not. Transitioning into September, September the 7th is open as well. Um, on the 14th, we're going to be welcoming Ashley Ramos, who's a candidate for the 2nd District. So this is inner city issues, uh, uh, minority issues, things of that nature, Hispanic issues. So if you want, it's different slants altogether. So even though we do have candidates for Congress, each of them comes from three totally different perspectives. Um, on, okay, that's on August the 14th. On the 21st, we'll be welcoming a young lady She's active in politics. Uh, Susan Hathaway Alton, but she maintains, and this is probably very true, that there are external forces impeding our country, imposing on our country from which we need protection. So the need for protection from external forces. I believe she identifies one of those forces as socialism. Anyhow, that's September the 21st. Okay, that's it. Uh, that's it. Now, this is that we transition into announcement period. If anyone has announcements of an event with a date and a time uh, uh, around Chicago, please give us a uh, uh, notice of what, he, what what's going on. Thank you, Tim. All right. Now, uh, okay, if there's no announcements, let's introduce... Uh, Tim Sipes, uh, I believe that's your name. Go ahead, sir, and you're ready to go. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. I think I'm gonna have something that might stimulate uh, some brain cells, so hopefully, let's see if that works. Uh, I'm gonna start off doing this a couple of, uh, a little differently perhaps than usual. I'm gonna take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about myself, because I don't want you walking away thinking, you know, afterwards, well, he was just another pretty face, you know, with the PhD. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit about my background. Uh, and I'm going to have some points that I want to point out uh, that I want to make for you uh, that will help under help you understand what, uh, what I'm talking about. And then I'll get into the body. We've got some pretty interesting stuff. I also brought in some posters that I had made for another event. And they're over here, and we'll we'll at least look at one of them, and maybe all three. Okay, so let's see. 
Um, unlike most academics, I, I just retired from Purdue University Northwest in uh, Westville, Indiana. Unlike, unlike most academics, I didn't just go from high school to college to uh, graduate school and teaching. Uh, I do things a little differently. When I was 17, uh, 1969, I joined the United States Marine Corps, which was not a very astute choice at the time. Uh, eventually, I, I earned the rank of sergeant, and I was lucky and stayed in the States all the time. I did not go to fight in Vietnam, for which I'm very, very fortunate. Okay. After that, I bummed around the country for, uh, well, I got out, I finished, I got in a couple years of uh, college while on active duty, got out, finished my degree at Florida State, and then never used my degree, my bachelor's degree. I, I hitchhiked around the country, smoked a lot of dope, you know, things like that. Uh, did a lot of hitchhiking and stuff like that. I don't want anybody to, 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 to have that question on mind. Anyway, so uh, eventually I became a printer. I spent nine years in in the printing trades, if you can put ink on paper, I've done it. Everything from these cheap little throwaways that litter your yard to the finest printing that you can do in the country. Um, so it's so I did that for about nine years. Got out of printing, did office work, and then high school teaching, and then at the then went back to uh, went back to school. And at the age of fifty one, got my PhD. So I've I've got a lot of range of experiences in this. I have, uh, since then, I've done a lot of research in the Philippines um, and around the world. I'm primarily a, a global labor scholar. Um, I have published four books and over 265 articles in the U.S. and about 11 countries. So I've got a pretty pretty wide, wide range of experiences. Now, one of the things I want to say about tonight is I do not want you to believe a single word I say. I'm very serious. I don't. I do not want you to believe a single word I say. What I'd like you to do is, I've told you a little bit about my background, that I've got quite a bit of experience and stuff. I'd like you to think about what I'm saying. If it makes sense, adopt it. If it doesn't make sense, get your hands up. If, for, especially for those of you in the room, maybe we can get some Zoom people in too as well, if necessary. But ask those questions, and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Uh, and I'm not going to blow smoke. I'll tell you what I know. If it's something I'm sure of, I'll tell you. If it's something I'm speculating, I'll tell you that as well. So uh, I want you, hopefully, each one of you will engage with what I'm saying, think about it, and then we can have uh, a, a good session and then hopefully a lively question and answer thing. Now, I will say something, one more thing before I get started, and that is you, some of the stuff you're going to hear tonight will sound pretty radical. Now, it's not radical because of the science. The stuff that I'm going to tell you about the, the science and things like this has been, has been overwhelmingly approved by scientists around the world. The problem that we have, one of the, one of the many problems we have, is that the media, the mainstream media in general, does not talk about this stuff, does not have any discussion, and so it's going to sound unique because you haven't heard it uh, before in some way. So let's uh, let's get started with with that book caveats. I'd like to go ahead and get started. All right now, we used to call climate change. We used to call it global warming because the fact is the temperature of the Earth is heating up. There is no doubt about it. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the leading authority in the world, climate change is unequivocal. But when, when they were using the term global warming, people would say, well, you say the temperature's going up, but last year we had the biggest winter we ever had, or things like that. So to, to, to sort of dodge that contradiction, they started using the, change, the, the term climate change. Because, because, it's, because the climate is changing, but the earth is warming up. There is no question about that. So, so for people that want to challenge that, bring it on. But the science is unequivocal that we are, the planet is warming up, and that has all kinds of uh, ramifications for us. And I'm going to talk about this. Um, okay, so let me let me start off so we can so we can understand so we make sure we all understand what's going on. Okay, so the the Earth is is 
traveling through space. And it's basically, to, to a large extent, just a rock. And we're going through, we're going through, going through the solar system. But this rock has a concentration. Uh, has a concentration uh, that we call the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere surrounds the planet, and the and the atmosphere is made up about seventy eight percent nitrogen and twenty one percent oxygen, and it surrounds the Earth, and it acts as a shield for it. So you're getting solar heat. You're getting light and heat from the sun coming down, and most of it gets that atmosphere <laughs> and skips off into space like a flat rock on a, on a calm lake. Okay. So the atmosphere, the atmosphere is protecting us. Now, what has been happening is that as we try to change the world, we build cities, as we build farmland, things like this, what you have happening is that we're using a lot of energy, the past including now. Um, that energy is usually in the form of what are called fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels are coal, gas, and uh, natural gas, natural gas, coal, and oil. Okay, when we use these things, when we use the fossil fuels to, to power our energy or whatever, they, and we burn them, they give off what we call greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, they include uh, uh, methane. They include nitrous oxide. And what those and what those greenhouse gases do is they attack that atmosphere that's protecting us from the sun. Okay, so you have you have the atmosphere surrounding surrounding the planet. We burn those fossil fuels that create greenhouse gases, and they attack the atmosphere. That's what's going on right now. Now, um, Joe, we had a we had a, 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 a slide that has uh, that Tim just brought up a moment ago. Yeah, there it is, right there. Let me come over. I don't know. Take this I don't know if we're screen sharing, but there it is. Okay. Well, let's. I'll go with what we got, and hopefully everybody can see it. All right. What this what this does is we have scientific evidence that goes back 800,000 years, 800,000 years. And in that period of time, now what we're looking at is for the relationship between uh, the temperature of the earth and carbon, carbon dioxide in the, and its equivalents in, in the atmosphere. And we're talking very, very small amounts. So like we're talking, so, so for the last 800,000 years, and you can see this with this line right here, what, what you're seeing is that that is 300 parts per million. So that if you had a million marbles in a, in a jar, only 300 of them would be carbon dioxide. So we're talking very, very minute amounts of, of change. Parts per million. Parts per million. Okay. Now, what we see here. Hang on a second. I got to get it shared. Oh, okay. Hold Sorry on. Sorry about that. I didn't know we had to do that. Got to get it shared with the uh, audience real quick. Oh, okay. All right. There we go. There we Sorry go. about that. And uh, now Thank we're you. good. We're good now. All right. Now, everybody on, online should be able to see this. What you're seeing here is this is the temperature. This is the. the, the uh, um, this is, this is the Earth back through 800,000 years. And you can see the temperature. I'm going to stand on the other side. I think it might That's be fine. easier. That's fine. Okay. And you can see it's gone up and down for 800,000 years. Okay. Now, if you'll notice, in 800,000 years, it never goes above this line. And that line is 300 parts per million. Okay. Now, this stretches out. There are eight different periods of, of, of peaks and valleys, things like this. Some of this is due to volcano eruption. Some of it is the tilting of the earth. Some of it is, uh, well, all kinds of things. Um, 
maybe sun, sunspots, whatever. But the temperature uh, of the Earth rises and falls, and it's gone for 800,000 years until we hit here. And this is 1750, which is the approximate date of the Industrial Revolution. And then, if I can back up here, okay. uh, the temperature shoots up. And this is only since 1750, it shot up and it goes up to here. Now, by the way, this chart is from NASA. I did not make this up. It's available on NASA's website right there today. And it goes up and it just lists today. But what you see is that since 1911, over 100 years ago, we have been for the first time in 800,000 years, for the first time above 300 parts per million. And it goes up. As of January of 2024, it was up to 420 parts per million. It was up 400, it was up to 420 parts per million as of January 2024. Now, just a <clears throat> um, I looked today at NASA and their latest reading just five, five months out, is that it's now up to 427 parts per million. Now, one of, the, one of the relationships we know is that the more carbon dioxide that you put into the atmosphere, the warmer things are going to get. So, so as, you, as your number goes up, it gets hotter on the planet. Yes, ma'am, do you have a question? How do they know? Let's, I, I, Ellen, let's. Years ago. I just wanted to scientists know. What they do now, I do not do frontline environmental uh, research. Yeah. Okay. But the way they do this is they drill cores into, um, into glaciers in Greenland. And they've been able to date to, to go back and date them for 800,000 years. Yeah. This is, like I say, this is, this is NASA putting this up. Not, not something by me. I just wonder how they got there. Yeah. No, it was they, they drill cores and then they can come up. And I do not know the procedure, the actual procedure, but they've got it so they can tell how many years it got, the temperature, how much carbon was in the, in the atmosphere, whatever. Okay. But the big point that I want you all to get on this is that for 800,000 years, it never once went up to 300 parts per million. Per million. Today it's at 427. All right. Now I want to thank Charlie. I forgot to do this. When he scheduled me a couple months ago, I didn't know he was going to, going to schedule it for a, for a heat wave. So I want to thank him for his prescience and in, in scheduling this. He did that very well. I hope it helps uh, bring this home. All right. What you so what you've got can't be now. Scientists will tell you that the temperature is warming up, the earth is warming up, okay? And that is true. Now, what we have going back for about 11,700 years, the glacial, the, the geologists call it the Holocene period. This is the period during which all human civilization developed, last 11,700 years. Uh, since, uh, since then, it's been, so it's been pretty stable. So the changes that we're, we're really seeing, and you can't see it on this particular chart because of the way they've set it up, they're carrying too much time. But basically, this stuff really jumps off in about 1950. Now, I, I was born in 51, so basically we're talking my lifetime. Okay, so you have an incredible and exponential increase of all kinds of things happening to the Earth, all kinds of damage to to the environment, things such as this. All right, so in fact, now there's a discussion, geologists are discussing and trying to, they're thinking about calling this a new period called the Anthropocene. And that just means basically from the 1950s on up. There's debate on that, it's not settled. Uh, in fact, a, a, a global, a global uh, commission turned that down. They don't think it's the proper term. They're still debating all this stuff out. But it's basically in, in our lifetimes, or certainly my lifetime, that we're seeing these, this major change. So you're seeing a lot of, you see, I mean, first of all, we had to recover from, from the devastation of World War II. You know, we had someone, 70 million people died. There was an incredible 
destruction, especially in Eastern Europe uh, and the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union. Uh, we also, you know, you had you had countries around the world that had suffered all kinds of economic damage and things like this. And so there was a great deal of buildup. There was the rise of chemical, uh, of synthetic chemicals that started being used in agriculture, things like this. But it's basically been, say, roughly from 1950 on, we've seen this massive increase. It, it, Is there a correlation no. between temperature and carbon dioxide? Yes. Yes, like I said, yeah. the more. Uh, Charlie, knock it off here. Took the question. We'll be through this and uh, Tim, we'll go back in the and the Please don't interrupt the speaker from the audience. Well, let me just go ahead and talk. And, and if you don't understand anything, bless me. Don't, don't try to educate others. That's my job tonight. Okay. So the point that I'm trying to. That's all right. Yeah, okay. The point I'm trying to make here is yes, there is a relationship between carbon dioxide and the temperature. The higher the carbon dioxide, the hotter the temperature. Okay, okay. Ellen, let's yeah. wait till the end of the. She won't listen. Just, just, just listen. Let me make the argument. We can discuss later, please. It's, it's very hard to jump back and forth. Thank you. Anyway. So what we see happening is that the temperature of the earth has been has been rising. Any, anyway, um, the temperature has been rising and it's now risen to 1.4 degrees centigrade above what we had in 1750. So if you see a reference to somebody saying, well, the earth's warm. Uh, one degree or it's warm, the two degrees, whatever. Usually it's in centigrade, but, but sometimes it'll be in Fahrenheit. But the point, the reference point is from, it started off at 17, in 1750 when you had the start of the Industrial Revolution. It's actually been refined now more so that it's, that it's been since the uh, period, sort of mid, uh, the, the median point between 1850 and 1900. That's when the world started, when industry uh, started expanding around the globe. So since that period, that 1850 to 1900 period, it's it's risen. The temperature is risen, and that's so. If they if they say the temperature is risen, what's it relationship? It's to that period, the 1850 to 9, 1900 period. Okay. Now the problem is, is that. Right now, we don't know what's going to happen. Human beings or any other type of animals, whatever, have never been through this process before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. I got to get, get some water here. Okay. Um, the thing is, is that according to most the overall consensus among climate scientists, uh, the, the overall consensus in the scientific world today is that once the temperature gets above 1.5 degrees centigrade, above that 1850 to 1900 period, we all bets are off. We don't know what's going to happen. One of the ways scientists are trying to understand this is they've developed the, the concept of um, um, tipping points. So what they try to do, they look at a series of different things, things like climate change, things like uh, 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 the amount of ice that's being melted over the Arctic every year, the, the Arctic ice is shifting, the rise of the oceans, things like that. They've got a number of things. And they have figured out what is about as safe as they can be sure of. And once you hit that limit, and we've exceeded some of them, we don't know what's going on. So the idea is when you cross these tipping points, it's, it's sort of like, you, remember the old movies uh, that we used to have, certainly in the 50s, about people traveling on 
it, it was usually African uh, rivers, but there'd be river boats going down the river and all of a sudden they go off the fall. And that's what the image that people are using is that's what we, when we get over 1.5, at some point in time, we don't know when, we could go off that fall. This stuff is, is threatening us to the extent that if we don't make major changes by the year 2030, if we don't make changes, significant changes by 2030, is that we're going to see the beginning of extermination of humans, animals, and most plants by the turn of the next century. That's how serious the science is. The beginning of extermination of humans, animals, and most plants by, by 20, 2200. So that's what we're that's what we're dealing with. Now, what is some of the impact of this increased uh, uh, Now, obviously, there are many more things that I'm going to talk about other than other than what I'm talking about tonight. Um, one, you, one, there's so much, I, I can't keep up with it unless I'm really staying on top of it. And the other thing is I can't communicate it. It just overwhelms me. So I'm going to stay pretty much on climate change tonight. Just to give you sort of a, a way to approach this and think about this. Okay. What is the problem for human beings with global warming, with, with, with the earth getting warmer? Now, obviously, if you've been paying attention this last week, there's a threat to health, particularly to us older folks, and also the very young. Um, he extended me, especially if it stays over a period of time where it doesn't, where it doesn't drop down over the evenings, it's very dangerous to human health. And this is happening around the world. Every last year was the warmest year in human history. And every month since then has, has been the warmest in human history for that month. So May was the warmest May in, in history. April, it is what it is. We're expecting June to also hit that record. They are expecting the 2000, 2024 um, will, be, uh, will be even warmer than last year. The problem is, is if we keep if we keep emitting these greenhouse gases that attack the atmosphere, it lets more sun, more heat in. It also, what it does is because the earth is warming up, we're seeing a reduction in ice coverage. Because one of the things happened, remember I said that, said that the, uh, so you had the, the heat, some of the heat got in, most of it skipped out, but some of it got in and then it would, it would come in and it would also hit the ice, depending on the part of the world and the, and the season we were facing. Uh, and that ice would also reflect some of that heat back out of the atmosphere. What's happening is that that atmosphere is getting weakening. We're getting more. We're getting more heat inside the atmosphere, and it's melting the ice. So that that heat that gets in is being trapped longer and longer. So this is how this stuff is adding up is that we're all uh we're we're getting more heat and capturing it and trapping it inside the atmosphere okay. now so so that's one of the things that uh that we have to be aware of is that it's causing much more of, of the ice to to melt if you see pictures there's all kinds of pictures in the, the internet and books on on the differences between say the 1920s and what we have today and and the differences are just overwhelming, and they're very they're very uh, very clearly defined. Um, this is happening around the world, and areas such as the Himalayas, which uh, are responsible for for millions of people getting their water, is they're melting and they're losing their source of water supply. So that's one of the things happening. Other things that are happening is that as you get more heat, more and more of that heat is being captured by the oceans. And that's that's also melting um, places like Greenland, like Antarctica, and things such as this. This is causing the oceans to rise. Now, when you look at the numbers, the numbers are not very impressive, but when you think about it, it's quite impressive. 
because most of the world's population is located in cities on the coast. Let's sort of take a mental trip. I don't have a map up. I'll just have to do it off the top of my head. But let's think about starting, uh, let's start with Asia. You see Tokyo, you see uh, Yokohama there on the coast, um, Tianjin in, in China, Shanghai, Hong Kong. You go around to uh, Haiphong, Vietnam. You go to Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. You go to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. You go to Jakarta and, and um, Indonesia. Let's see, uh, Melbourne and Australia is a city. So is Sydney, so is Brisbane. They're all on the ocean. You keep going around. There's, there's uh, uh, Calcutta and Bombay and in India. You go, if you keep going around, you hit Durban, South Africa, and then Cape Town on the west side of South Africa. Uh, then you come up to the Mediterranean, you have, you have cities such as uh, Alexandria, uh, Egypt, you have you know, Greece, you have uh, Naples, you have Rome, you have Turin, you have Barcelona, Spain, you come around, you see uh, London, you see Rotterdam, you see Amsterdam, on up to Stockholm, and that's just outside the U.S., but let's think about the cities in the U.S. There's Boston, New York. Philadelphia, uh, Newport News, Virginia, that area, Savannah, Georgia, Miami. You get in the Gulf, you got Mobile, Alabama, you got Houston, Texas, uh, going on. Um, they, if you go uh, around Latin America, I don't, I don't know of any cities. I think Buenos Aires is the only major city in Latin America that's on the coast. I'm not certain on that. But you come up the West Coast of the United States, you get San Diego, Los Angeles, Los Angeles. Uh, uh, San Francisco, um, Seattle, Vancouver, British Columbia. So the point I'm trying to make is that we've got massive, massive cities with hundreds of millions of people in each, you know, in these cities. And what happens is the as the as the, 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 the ice melts and the oceans warm up. Is that you're getting more and more uh, melting into the ocean, the, the the surface levels are rising, and it's threatening the well-being of these cities. Now you you also have to keep in mind it doesn't even really have to get to the to the uh, doesn't even have to get to the street level because most of our utilities are underneath the ground. I mean, CTA in a certain city in the Midwest, for example. But all these cities, you have sewage, you have electricity, you have some transportation that are all underground and they're all being threatened. Yeah, in Chicago. So, yeah, eventually it will go up as well. So the idea. Wait a minute. Let's wait till the. Let's wait. Let's wait till the question. Yeah, wait, wait a minute. Let's wait until the question answers because it's hard enough to pull all this stuff together for you. And let me do that, and then I'll have plenty of time. Be glad to answer questions or, or debate or whatever you want to. But I want to get the point out. The point is, is that people around the world are being threatened. You're seeing. You're going to see more and more migration. Now, I don't care what Trump or Biden say about the border, stuff like that. People are coming. You need some water, sir? Are you okay? Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to check. Anyway, the point being is that people are going to be going to be facing more and more threats to their li livelihood, to their very existence. So, for example, one of the things, as the temperature goes up, What's that going to do to crop production? Well, you know, that's a real starvation. Yeah, it's 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 very basic, um, <laughs> and that and that this is going to affect our growing seasons. Uh, one of the things we're going to see, and one of my students did some really interesting work on this, is for example, the U.S. already the EPA is thinking out things. Uh, about implications of climate change. And one of the things that people are, are thinking that we'll see more and more migration from inside the U.S., from along the Gulf Coast in particular, up north. You know, 
and that's going to, well, not only Chicago, but for example, Indiana, you know, a lot of farm country, a lot of corn, but the people, it's going to affect the corn production on one side, but on the other side, we're going to have people move up from the Gulf Coast because, and, and Florida, because it's too dangerous to live in. I don't know if you know this, but in some states, I believe it's true in both Florida and California. Florida, I think in general, I don't think any of the insurance companies are writing insurance policies in Florida anymore. I know in California, State Farm no longer, no longer writes uh, insurance policies in California. The point being, if you if you got a house or something, and there's a fire or a flood, and you can't get uh, insurance, you're in trouble. You're also going to be have a lot of a lot of difficulty selling that house to somebody else. They can't. They're not going to be able to buy insurance. So people are going to be migrating just within the United States. And of course, Biden and Trump have no no clue about what to do with either of those problems. Okay. But what we're also seeing, now one of the things by the way, is that the oceans today, about 90% of this, all this heat that gets captured is captured in the ocean. And it's causing things like coral reefs to bleach. What that basically means is that it's killing the coral reefs. The coral is a home for plankton, which is the basic, the, the bottom line for the, the agricultural food production. The food chain, you know, so you get plankton, they get eaten by little fish, and little fish get eaten by bigger fish, and bigger fish, da, 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 on up to us. But the problem is, one third of the world's population is dependent on, on food from the oceans. One third of the world's population. As the oceans warm up and it kills uh, more coral, we're going to see that having an effect on food stocks and survival for people uh, around around a good part of the world. So this is not just some abstract feel good, let's say the polar bears and not worry about anything else. This, this stuff is essential, it's going to happen. Okay. Now, along with this, you also have um, things like, in the, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you look at the weather, and you see hurricanes come into the Caribbean. The, the, the hurricanes that get in the Caribbean are stronger than those on the Atlantic. Why? The Caribbean shower. That means that water gets hotter. That has more energy when the, when the hurricanes come. It sucks that energy up into the atmosphere. It pulls more water up there. And then when they hit, they hit with more force, etc. So if you think back to Hurricane Katrina, the one that devastated New Orleans, I think in 2012, you know that was a that was a uh, Category One hurricane when it crossed Florida. Then it got over the Caribbean and got up to a five, which is the highest level. That backed off a little just before it hit New Orleans. It was it hit land as a four. But what we're seeing is the Caribbean. We're seeing more and more stronger hurricanes. And they're devastating things like this. Hurricane Harvey, which hit Houston in 2017, was said to drop drop basically a million gallons of water for every person in that region. Think about that. A million gallons of water per person. That's a lot of water. You know, a lot of flooding and things like this. Now, other parts of the country like particularly California, has been having brutal fire fire all over the state. You know, they're bigger, they're longer, the fire season is lasting longer and things like this. And again, like I say, there are areas that, that you cannot get insurance for against fire because it's just not safe. So what we're seeing is a bunch of things that are happening and affecting the United States all over the country. And one, if it's being reported in the news, it's just, well, this is happening and this happening, but they, they don't want to tie it together. They really don't want us to understand the stuff is hitting the fan, folks. And it's going to get worse. Okay. Now, that, so the problem that we have, and I'm going to pivot here in a minute, but the problem we have means that 
if we keep doing what we're doing now, we're going to keep putting more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's going to further attack the, the atmosphere and let more heat in. More heat's going to get trapped and things are going to affect human beings all, and animals and most plants all over the planet. And the, the discussion right now is that we're talking the beginning of extermination by the next century. On the waitress, that's all. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, all right, so that's one thing. Now, the problem is, you're getting, we're getting, there's starting to be more and more interest in, well, what can we do about this stuff? Good reason. Okay. But most of the solutions that you're getting, uh, and you can hear this in, in uh, the concept of green, uh, green New Deal, sometimes it's called that, sometimes it's called green capitalism, stuff like that. This program will not work because what they're talking about is that we will continue to grow and growth, which is essential, which is required, the systemic requirement of capitalism is killing us. It's that simple. And I wanna talk about this in a minute, but I wanna make the point that our economic system that we have here now is killing us. It's threatening the well-being of every one of us. Okay. Now, one, we're not being told about these things uh, when they're put, you know, when they're put out and they're, they're not brought together. But that's what we're talking about. So anybody that says, "Well, we can just go ahead and have growth. We'll have it with solar power instead of uh, and, instead of coal and oil and, and fossil fuels." That's not going to happen. The problem is growth. Capitalism must grow or die. Capitalism is the most economically productive system of, of economy that's ever been developed. It's incredibly productive, but it's coming at a cost to all of us. And it's going, and it, we're going to have to find a new way of doing that. I'll talk about that for a little bit in a moment. But the point is that our economic system is killing us. Now, the other thing about capitalism, and, and this is, even, and by the way, there's a growing number of books out um, uh, on this, saying that, that growth is killing us, that we either stop growth or die. Uh, there, are books, uh, there are books out, um, Jason Hickel is somebody that's written uh, about this most recently. Uh, I've reviewed some of his work. It's quite good as far as it goes. I don't think it goes far enough, but, but it's quite good. There's a growing number of people that are saying the problem is our economic system. Okay. So that's that's certainly certainly one of the things that we need to fo focus on. What's not also being said by a lot of people, including Jason Hippel, who's one of the best, is that not only is capitalism killing us through growth, but capitalism, our particular capitalism that we have in the United States of America, is basically based on dominating other countries around the world. <laughs> we cannot survive. We can't. We cannot survive. We cannot survive. We cannot survive without ripping off and killing other people around the world. I, would you excuse me, sir? I want my, your participation. I'd like to have it out in a, in a moment when it's helpful. What's that? I said I'd like you to hold off and, and wait until I finish, and then then you're more than welcome to participate. But it's our Lord. Mike, anyway, Mike, please. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that the way we're being told our economic system works is not an accurate one. What we're being told is that the United States is just another cap another capitalist country. We're just another country and we're just doing the best we can and stuff like that. I argue that that is wrong. I think the way that we have to understand this is that the United States of America, our country, is the center of what should be properly known as the U.S. empire. Since 1945, the U.S. countries around the world, 
and we're doing it through massive amounts of, of expenditures for our for our war machine. I refuse to call it defense because it has nothing to do with defense. It's a war machine. And that we have spent billions and billions, in fact, trillions of dollars to build this up. Let me give you, let me come at it a different way so maybe it, it, it makes more sense. One of the things we can look at is what's called the national debt. Now, the United States government every year has a budget and they will project the, before the year, they'll say, we're gonna spend so much money on this project and so much money on that project and so much money on that project. And then they'll, they'll decide the tax rate to cover those expenses. That's the way it's supposed to work. So it's, it's just like a family budget with a whole lot more zeros behind it. But it's basically the same. Every one of you have done it one way or the other, I'm willing to bet. Um, so at the end of the year, they come and they say, well, we took more money in than we spent. So that's a surplus. Or we spent more money than we took in. That's a deficit. But what the government does and they publish the details every year, this is not something I'm making up, is that they look at the surplus or deficit and combine that with all the other surplus and deficits back to 1789 when our country became uh, officially a country, okay? So think about this. If we look into this, and I've been, I've been watching this stuff for 40 years, is that from 1789, so George Washington's uh, administration, up to the end of Jimmy Carter's, 192 years, in that 192 years. So this includes factoring in all kinds of things, including the wars of 1812, the Civil War, the war against the Native Americans on the plains, the Spanish-American and Philippine-American wars, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam plus things like the interstate highway system, things like the electrification of the South, the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, and the moon, and the space program to go to the moon, all this stuff. At the end of that period, when Jimmy Carter left office, our national debt was $0.9 trillion. It's actually $909 billion, but you know, who's counting at those numbers? But it's less than a trillion. Today, in 40, 41 years, 42 years, our national debt today is at $34.4 trillion. This is just in 40 years. We've gone from under one to over 34 trillion. Okay, so in other words, much of what we see, now there's a, a lot of talk, we've got this election coming up and I don't care which side you're on, you know, uh, but the thing is, is People are bragging about the good economy. Well, they don't say why the economy is doing so well. Because for most of us, we are hurting or we see our friends hurting. We certainly know our neighbors and stuff are hurting. We know millions and millions of jobs were lost since the 80s, you know, when the manufacturing went offshore and stuff like that. Nobody's asking, where's this growth coming from? Is it coming from real economic growth or... Is it coming from us writing hot checks? And that's basically what we're living off. We're living off hot checks. In other words, we're writing checks and there ain't no money in the bank. We are so bankrupt, it's unreal. Now, where this, where this comes from, and just in the last 40 years, up to, I, I haven't figured in the cost of the Ukraine war stuff. So up to, not counting Ukraine, but from, from Ronald Reagan up to the end of Trump, uh, we had spent $18.3 trillion on direct military spending. The number should be higher because it doesn't include things for veterans uh, you know, and, and VA services and stuff like that, or uh, nuclear uh, arms. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the US government doesn't put the cost of nuclear arms under the defense industry, they put it under energy. The Department of Energy controls that budget. Not that they want, would want to mislead us or anything like that. Okay, but the point being is that we've spent almost $20 trillion in kills and destroys. 
and it has happened around the world. Like I say, you know, I was I was a Marine during Vietnam. That's what we were doing. We weren't liberating anybody. We weren't fighting communism. Any this other bullshit. But they told us we were killing and destroying, and that's what we continue to do today. That, and that's what we're doing also in Ukraine. And it's also we're also helping Israelis in Gaza kill and destroy. That's us. That is us. Okay. So the point being is we have to understand you want to, if you want to try to figure this out, as I think some of you at least are, is that the U.S. is trying to control the world and we're willing to kill anybody or her in country that doesn't want to go with accepting our domination. It's, 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 well, whether it's oil or not, we actually export more oil than anybody else right now. But there, there are other places that there are other places that are dependent on that, and that's a whole. I can go into that Q and A. I'm going to do that here. The point, the point being though, is that we we are actively working around the world. We are killing and destroying. We're certainly working. And when I use the term empire, it's not like the Roman Empire. You know, the Romans went out and conquered all the area around the Mediterranean and across Europe into Britain, for example. Um, the U.S. is an inquiring empire, you know, in territory. What we do is we understand if we have a political and economic we can go, we don't have to. It's cheaper. It's not as ugly. We can get away with it. But the concept of domination is absolutely central to what the United States is doing. Okay. I'm going to have another, another sip here. Okay, so part of the thing that I think that we have to do is we have to try to understand this. And you may agree and you may, may disagree with me, and that's fine. We can talk about that, see if we can, uh, where we stand uh, after I finish. But I think we have to start demanding that our media, our government, our schools and stuff at least tell the truth. Um, well, we got to be careful because we got to have some nuance, and nuance is not an American trait. Uh, we didn't get taught that. You know, it's either everything's evil or it's good. You know, but think about this: every country. Now, I've I've traveled very extensively. I've been around the world twice. Personally, um, I've seen a lot of particularly Southeast Asia, uh, but also Europe. But I've been I've done research on six of the seven continents, so I've seen a little bit of little bit of this this uh, real estate. And one of the things I've always found is that there is no country that is all bad or all good. We all have our strengths and we have our weaknesses. And for example, you see everybody go crazy about Cuba. Right? Cuba is not my ideal of a per of a paradise, personally, from what I know of it. On the other hand. I give them credit for things they do. They have an excellent education system. They have a health system that's probably one of the finest in the world. And we can't, that doesn't fit into our lexicon because they're evil. You know, they're not, they're not doing what we say, but we've got to do that. And that means we've got to apply that same thing to the United States. The United States is not evil, but it's not all good either. And we've got to look and we've got to start thinking critically about what we know about. And what it's like, and I would say this even goes to the media. Now, for example, I would I will argue that the New York Times is the finest mainstream media outlet in the country. However, if you read the New York Times, you see there are some areas where they're really good, and some areas are atrocious. You cannot trust them for anything about the empire. You can't trust them for anything on Russia. You can't trust them on China. You know, so you have to That's learn. Real. <laughs> yeah, and certainly not the Middle East and Israel in particular. But things are one of the interesting things about that. Is, wait a minute, we've got to be careful here. Because one of the things is that we're seeing things in the New York Times about Israel that I would have never in a million years thought we'd see. And that's part of the that's part of the result of the of the resistance to the Israeli uh, war in Gaza. Well, whether this will continue once the war's over or not, I don't know. But it is happening. 
So we can't, we can't be quick to say everything's all bad or everything's all good. It doesn't work that way. And, and what, it, what happens is that if we take that position, then others can tear apart our argument because our argument's not based on reality, it's on ideology. So this is one of the things I find terrible. I mean, I have a lot of problems with Democrats. I'm not here, I'm not here as a Democrat or anything like that. But one of the differences we're seeing in this country right now is the ideology. And you see this particularly with the MAGA movement. Now, yes, they may be more conservative, but the problem with ideology, and I don't like the ideology of the left either, is that when somebody's being ideological, their, their position is made up. Don't bother me with the facts. I know what things are, this or that. You know, I find that terribly reprehensible because I think we have to, we have to think. We need to think. We need to, have, we need to have nuance to understand that some things can be good and bad at the same time. Um, so I, I want to be I want to be careful about condemning all the mainstream media just off the top or accepting anything in the anything in the alternative press. You've got to think critically, folks. Now, what are we going to do about all this thing? So what we've got happening, what I've argued tonight, is that right now the United States is bankrupt, that we're we're living off the hot checks. And that this has got to be stopped. We've got to stop killing and destroying people. We've got to we've got to find ways to do something differently. We've got to stop this climate change. Now, and this is this is something that I've put together. Uh, you, I doubt no, no, in broad range of my writings, how far they go. You probably haven't heard of this stuff at all. But I'm arguing that we got to quit producing so much. In other words, I think we're producing so much crap. Think about going to the grocery store and there's probably what, 37 different types of, of, uh, of uh, breakfast cereals. Do we need 37 different types? Do we need all of them? What I'm arguing, and it will take, it'll take a lot of experience and effort to do this, but I think that, we're, our, that we are producing so much that we can cut it back so that people only have to work maybe one year out of four. That's a real different program. Key to that, to make that work, is that we would have to take, we would have to start taxing income above a certain level at 100%. So for example, if people made, say, and you'd set it, whatever, we'd have to discuss to figure out what level you want to set it at. But if you want to set it at, uh, two hundred thousand or five hundred thousand for a family a year is 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 maximum, and everything above that gets taxed and put in and and provides some ways to support these people that I think can can, can not work three out of four years. We have the rich, we have the the the, the wealth, the resources, and they're controlled by the rich people, and. We can take that away from them. Now, obviously, this is not something that's going to be very popular today, but we've got, I, I'm arguing we've got to cut this massive production down. We've got to quit killing, uh, we've got to quit attacking and killing our atmosphere, that we've got to find different ways to relate. So think about what would happen if you only had to work one year out of four. You wouldn't have to. You wouldn't have to commute every day. You wouldn't have to go to work. Now I'm I'm somebody who's worked all all my life. I don't think working for a living is all that cracked up to be. To be honest, I think we have a lot of stress, a lot of inequality. But I believe if we set a a, a cap for income and, and taxed everybody everything over hundred over that limit at a hundred percent, that we could. We could share that with the American people and do it so they would get a pay raise. Because today, today the the average the average income for an American family of four is fifty nine thousand dollars. A little off of that. That is less than 
less than two times our poverty rate. That a, a fair, fair way to approach this was to say, all right, we're going to pay, we're going to make sure every American gets two times the, po the official poverty line today. By the way, the official poverty line is terribly insufficient. Right now for a family of four, it's roughly about $32,000 a year. Now, if you want to live, if you want to live and support four families, four people of $32,000, good luck, but you ain't doing it without a hustle on the side. I don't care whether it's whether it's shade tree mechanicing. I don't care if it's you know if it's uh, you know gambling or whatever. If it's prostitution, you're doing something on the side to survive at that level. I think if we if we went to double this now, this is over a third of the American uh, public that we could give them an income of roughly sixty four thousand dollars a year to sustain them on the years where that they don't work. But what that, what that would mean is that people would work one year out of four. And during those years when you're not working, you could do it however you wanted to. Some people might want to sleep <laughs> that time off. Others want to get done for that. What I think you'd see happen over time is people would come together and try to find ways to, to improve their communities and things such as this. But we've got to, whether you agree with me on this point or not, I think we've got to think on that level that we've got to be we've got to be able to address the issues because the issues are there. The issues are there. We've got to have some creative thinking, but we absolutely. I think there is there is nothing that I've seen that's contradicting. Is that, is that we absolutely have to cut off this economic growth. You gotta find ways to take care of people because I'm not, you know, as I've been talking tonight, I've been talking about the interaction between people and the environment. They're not separated. You know, you've got to consider them both. You've got to see how they interact. You've got to take care of people. We can do that, but we've got to think outside the box and then we've got to start coming together to find other people among us that want to start talking serious about this stuff. Because from everything I saw, and I, I realized I just spoke a moment ago, is, is that I said that we'd see extermination begin in the 22nd century, and then I said 2200, they're not the same. Then 20, 2100, it's sooner than that. It's, we're talking 70, uh, 76 years, I think, if the math is real quick. Because that's what we're talking about. This is a crisis, it needs to be looked at. We've got to not accept. The nonsense we're being told. We've got to find people to come together, not only to 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 organize their communities, but also to change the political system. And if we don't do it, tell me who is. Because I'm not seeing the mainstream, the, the the officials, and I include both the Democrats and the Republicans and and everybody involved in that are not talking about. This. We've got to make that a conversation. We've got to do it now. With that, I'm going to stop. Thank you for your attention. I hope it stimulates brain cells, and then we'll open up with you and answer. Thank okay. you. I want to first. I want to say thank you, sir. It seems like you've done quite a bit of uh, of um preparation and uh, talking. I think it's one of the most comprehensive things we've had done. You've definitely tried to uh to think out your stuff today, and I do appreciate. How about that. questions? We're going to questions, Charlie. So take the first one. You've got the first question. Yeah. I have a question. Are you recommending that we freeze the standard of living where it is right now for everyone and maybe restore maybe every four years? I guess we just replace stuff that wore out or broke. Are you freezing the standard of living in the United States and the world? I, I'm, I'm sorry, Charlie. I didn't quite catch all that. What is? Just get to the essence of your question. I'll try. It. Are Are you asking? Are you recommending that we freeze the standard of living where it is right now, and maybe come back four years from now to for replacement parts or for things that wore out? Yeah. It's, and so. This is going to be the standard of living 
forever in the United States? No, actually, if we do it, see, first of all, we have to think about this on a global level. We're not going to be able to solve our problems in the United States without considering everybody else in the globe. I'm going to argue that those in the in the so-called developed countries. Now, let me qualify that so this makes sense. I don't like that term developed countries. In reality, they are imperial countries because the reason we have a higher standard of living is we rip and rob people of Latin America, uh, the Middle East, uh, Asia, and Africa off. We've stolen their resources, their natural materials, sometimes their people. Okay, so in other words, what I think we have to do is those of us in the so-called advanced countries, the ones I argue are imperial countries, we have to lower our standard of living. We cannot stay at this level. It's killing us. At the same time, those other countries need a chance to, to have a little slack so they can grow some of theirs because they've been held back because of us. So, yes, for the United no. States, I'm saying that we would have to cut back the, the uh, U.S. standard and the European standard of living. Yes. Okay. Follow up. So you're saying that farmers will stop growing food for four years? I didn't say that. I would say. Well, I'm I would say, that, I would say that people have to, to would only have to work one year out of four. That that means you, we'd have to have people that would work on farms to grow crops and stuff like that. But it wouldn't be the same people every year. Okay. We'll get to your we'll get to your question now. I think that's Jake at seven seven three, correct? We'll get to, we'll get to your question next, Jake. Save Cohen, go ahead. Well, maybe you could um, discuss about earthquakes because earthquakes they say is uh, some of it is caused by the um, uh, climate change. Okay, you'll give me that. Thank you. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I think that it's very likely, but where it's certainly likely, it seems like, you know, in areas that we we build on on uh, earthquake faults, such as San Francisco and places like that. But I don't know. I don't think, as far as I know, I've not seen any evidence that said uh, earthquakes are ca caused in total or, or in part by climate change. Uh, uh, who's next? All right, Frack, Jake, go ahead. Fracking quakes all, Jake, are all over ahead. the place. Finally, you had your turn. Jake, go ahead. All right, the guy on the phone call, go ahead, unmute, and ask your question. Hi. Can, can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Jake. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I got two questions. You, you got two questions. Um. You mean, first of all, you mean to say that uh, people in uh, socialist countries don't use oil and don't, uh, don't, ha don't have economic growth? That's number one. And number two, how would you define economic growth? What do you mean by it exactly? Okay. Well, first of all, yes, they do use it, but they use it a lot less than we do. Um, and, it's, and again, it's usually limited to the very wealthy like most countries, even the poorest countries have their elites, and they will live at a standard of living higher than most of the people. I mean, I've seen this firsthand in the Philippines, for example. When I'm talking about economic growth, it's just what, I mean, we use the term gross domestic product uh, to refer to this. It's the sale of goods and ser services in the market um, that is hopefully used for productive means. We are going to have to cut this. We cannot live at this standard of living without killing the atmosphere. If we kill the atmosphere, it's game over. Yeah, I think it's that clear. All right, who's was my up? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry about that. When you say only one out of four, one year out of four years to work, you're talking about socialism, it seems like. And then I don't hear you say anything about Russia or China. Uh, and we got a submarine in Cuba right now, a, a, a nuclear submarine, Russia, we're being attacked in Ukraine, Israel, around the world. The United States is trying to stand up for, for, for freedom. I think we have freedom in this country. Well, 
thank you. Thank you for your opinion, sir. I totally disagree. I totally disagree. Um, a couple of reasons. I mean, China or Russia is not a panacea or anything like that. But for example, one of the excuse me, uh, one of the things is that we've been taught is that uh, the Soviet Union created the Cold War. That's not true. That's not true. The U.S. and the U.K. created the Cold War, and I've done a lot of research on it. In fact, I'm writing a new book about that. Um, the United States has not fought for freedom anywhere, certainly not since World War II. We did not fight for freedom in Vietnam. We didn't fight for freedom in, in, in Korea. We didn't fight for freedom in Afghanistan or, or Iraq. None of that was for freedom. A lot of it, some of it was for But think about, think, think about this. Okay. okay. So we, we've been told it's about it, the war in Iraq was about oil. Let's oh, let's yeah. think about this. Oh, wait, wait a minute, brother. Listen to me for a minute because I'm trying to address your issue. Yeah, don't try to shut up. No, I'm not going to shut up. Wait till we're yeah. said nothing but oil for the last hour. So and I, and I, 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 I okay. If you give me a second, I'm going to address your your position right now. All you have to do is listen, and then you'll get to come back to me. All right, look. Let him answer, Mike. All right, all right. Anyway, we have been told for years that the United States was dependent on oil from the Middle East. One of the things that I did when the when the when Bush invaded uh, invaded Iraq was I went to see uh, how much oil we were dependent on. And we were dependent on something like, we got at that time, something like 20% of our oil. I, I forget the exact numbers, but pretty close from the Gulf. We weren't dependent on Gulf oil. We never, as far as I know, we never have been. But who is dependent? The rest of the world. Yes. China, Japan, Russia, yeah. et cetera. And that what I would argue, if you think about this, particularly countries like, like, um, China, Western Europe is dependent on Middle Eastern oil, things like this. What, what happened was that the United States has kept their hands around that Middle Eastern oil so that if any of our so-called trading partners and out, got out of control, we could just squeeze them and cut them off. And I believe that's why that war in Iraq was fought. Not for us, not directly for us to get oil, but to put a, have our hand around the throat of our economic competitors. You know, if you see, if you go back and look at the original argument for the war in Iraq, the U.S. planned to set up 11 military bases in Iraq, um, and that that was and that was what we wanted to do, and that it was after oil. Oil, you're you're absolutely right. Oil is. Oil is an absolutely essential commodity in the world. It's necessary. The U.S. wants to control it. I agree. But you've got to have some sophistication. You can't just be a one-horse Charlie, in my opinion. You've got to understand that's part of the thing. Part of the U.S. trying to defend the world. But the U.S. is not defending, uh, defending freedom anywhere. And that's a bunch of pure propaganda, in my about, opinion. What about right here in the United States? We've got more freedom than Russia or China. That's with the, we have freedom compared to those countries. Well, so. so we don't have freedom so, of speech anymore. Time. Time. We don't have freedom of speech anymore. It's just we'll keep interrupting everybody. Well, let, let's, let us uh, answer the question. I have a two-part question about sea level rise. I'm going to ask it one at a time. First, do you have any reliable sources you can recommend about sea level rise? Um, I'm not sure of anyone that just focuses on this, but the source that you can go to that is it's never referenced is NASA. NASA has an incredible website. It's climate.nasa.gov. And they have stuff, sea level rise, uh, shrinkage of ice every year, things like that. So you can play for hours if you're if you're after data on this. I've never seen it advertised, and it's got a different uh, URL than most places, but it's climate.nasa.gov. Look at it, uh, and it'll, it'll give you a lot of this stuff that I'm just sort of doing off the top of my head, but it's there. Depends level will rise. My 
assumption would be that there would be glaciers still draining into Lake Superior. Are there that you know of? Okay. You know, I don't know. Uh, I've not looked at it in depth. It's just I don't see how you can't have the Great Lakes rise somewhat uh, as the oceans are rising. I may be wrong on that one. But in, in general, the cities around the world, the oceans are rising. And for example, if Greenland were to go, if Greenland were to melt, the oceans would raise 21 feet around the world, 21 feet. So that would wipe out every one or large parts of every one of those cities that I mentioned. Who's next? All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Karina, go ahead. Karina, you're on. Okay, um, I'm, there's the populations in some nations have been declining. The human populations in some nations have been declining. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it depends on the particular country, first of all. Um, the issue, and, and I have not ta ta um, talked about population. Um, obviously, there, there are some countries that have large populations, especially poor countries that have uh, are gro growing populations, but the world's rate of growth has gone down. Um, but the other issue that never gets talked about is the consumption rate of countries. So for example, India's population has grown tremendously, as we know, but their consumption level is, is still far behind us. I don't know, I think this was true around 2000. I'm not sure if I've seen anything more recent than that, to be honest. But at that time, an Indian child was said to consume, um, I'm sorry, that one American child consumed as much as 70 Indian children some phenomenal rate but but when you're talking about population you've got to look at the consumption rate mm -hmm. so i would say that that population reductions in these so-called developed countries the imperial countries is a good thing uh i would guess that it's probably a good thing in most other countries because just if you have more numbers you know you have to have more schools, you have to have more food, you have to have more housing and things such as this. So, so uh, I hope that we did that. I hope that answered your question. Ellen, 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 okay. Then we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get you in a minute, Charlie. Go ahead, Ellen. So um, I missed a, a lot of your argument about what to do, but um, what is, you know, there's, I wonder what you think about this, that there's, you know, people that disagree with you. There's a whole lot of people that are climate skeptics and they've got science saying that things are colder than they used to be. And I, you know, so I, I really value your science and I think you've got integrity and truth, but, um, you know, how do you, how do we deal with this, this, what seems to be a manufactured, uh, you know, disagreement with that there's any problem. And, um, and and I wonder what you think of, you know, you say you don't think Biden's doing anything or they're just not saying anything. I think they're manufacturing uh, a disagreement so that nothing gets done and they can keep, um, you know, deliberately, corporations can deliberately tear down the Amazon and, um, you know, bring about our destruction. Okay, thank you for that. Um, part of the thing, well, you hit on a bunch of things right there. Part of the thing is that the tremendous disinformation campaign that's going on in this country. Um, Fox News in particular is garbage. I will not even listen to it. Um, a lot of people think it's a credible source. I'm sorry, I've looked at this. I've taught on the media. I find it garbage. I will not listen to it. Um, that it has any kind of an impact in this country is disgraceful, in my opinion. And that's not to say that the others are all good, but I'm just saying Fox is no good. Part of the thing is you're right in that this disinformation that's out here is to confuse us, to keep us from doing what we need to do. It's just like the cigarette campaigns. You know, the evidence was overwhelming a long time ago 
people would say, well, we don't have any total proof. Well, to have total proof, you'd have to give a baby, you'd have to have a controlled experiment and give a baby every day of his life and have a, have a cigarette. Well, we're not going to do that. We can't do that. Part of the thing is, what, what I want to suggest to you is I'm not making this stuff up. I'm getting this stuff NASA is unquestionably one of, the, one of the preeminent scientific resources in the world. Go to, go to climate.nasa.gov. Look at what they have to say. But here's the thing, folks, is there's all this nonsense about, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not really true. It's really cooling off. 97% of all the climate scientists in the world recognize that, climate, that, that the climate change is real and it is happening, 97%. Yeah. So, so and, and goodness knows where those 3% are at, but 97%. So if you took 100 climate scientists, you put 97 on one side and you put three on the other side, and I'm sorry, that's not equivalent. And, and the science is overwhelmed. And now the, the, the preeminent, the preeminent uh, climate, organization in the world is called the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, IGPC. No, I, I, I keep getting this one, IPPC, something like that. Anyway, and you can find this, NASA will refer to it, but that they say that climate change is, climate crisis is unequivocal and it's caused by human beings. It's not, I mean, you have to explain, remember that chart that I had 800,000 years, I've got it up on this poster over here. We have not had below, above 300 parts per million in over 800,000 years. Something happened, and that something was human beings and our capitalist economic system. That's what's causing it. And nobody can show anywhere near a, a convincing argument against that. Isn't there recommendations for how to bring it down? Okay, okay. That same group? All right. That yeah, no, that's that's a, let me ask this let me answer that one, Tim, real quick. There, they haven't, as far as I know, they have not come up with a solution. But there's no question we've got to cut we've got to cut the the emissions. Okay, so we're we're going to do one round of questions at a time. So Charlie and I want to ask second round questions, but Mike gets a first round question. And then okay. Also, okay, you know, just the review. Okay, when when the when, uh, when, when we have this uh, climate change tipping point that everybody told us talking about, let's review that. What's going to happen? We're going to have massive droughts, one. We're going to have sea level, like New York will be completely underwater, two. What other things? Droughts and famine. Droughts, famine, destruction of crops. Excuse me. Um, we're going to have migration, climate migrants coming right, from around the world. Right, that's three, yeah. There's all kinds of things. What other, what other kinds of things? What about insects? Wildlife. Well, like okay, well, that's, I mean, you actually had a hit on something right there, is that one of the things we're having is that as the temperature's going up, we're seeing insects travel. So, for example, we never had um, the Nile, West Nile virus in this country until 1997. But it's a temperature's gotten up. You know, one good thing though is that we're going to be able to grow into the Siberia's and then I'm going to ask about that into northern Canada. Okay, wait. And, and so, what are the other the negatives? Of, uh, Mike, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a, I, I, wait, wait, we're on three, right? We're on the. Well, the, I mean, you say three, but like water, they're all of and, nothing. But the fact that plants. a third of, of the of humanity can lose its food source seems to be a major one. You know that the, that the cities are that the water is rising to threaten cities around the world. Is there anyone who has a question who hasn't asked one yet? All right, we, we, we're going to try to get a few people before we do a second round. Uh, go ahead. In your climate change research, have you been able to accurately pinpoint the root cause of this problem? I, I, I'm not sure there is a root cause and that one other, what we do 
since roughly 1950, we've seen a massive increase in um, all kinds of impacts on the world. There's a book called uh, The Anthropocene by Ian Angus that goes into this in depth. And, and it, I highly recommend the book. It's a very accessible book. He's got some incredible charts. I mean, so there are that. It looks to me, as I understand it, is that this is being caused by this massive increase of production that you have in the post-World War II period that is caused to, to uh, revive the capitalist economic system around the world. So if you're looking for one thing, and, and this is a major argument, it's not just me, is that capitalism is the cause of that. It's tied into that, yeah. Any other first round questions? Okay. Right. Tim hasn't asked one yet. Uh, sorry, Andy, Andy's turn. Andy, go ahead. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't the production, when you're saying capitalistic production, uh, doesn't that, a lot of the production was dependent massively on fossil fuel, coal and oil, right? And gas. Yes. If the world rapidly, if we spent a fraction of what we're spending on nuclear power and fossil fuel subsidies, if we went solar uh, in a big, huge way, we'd be taking in free energy from the sun that doesn't pollute, right? We wouldn't, we would cut down pollution a huge amount and be able to still maintain some kind of production. I, 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 I like your idea. You're absolutely right in cutting down the waste. You know, people shouldn't have three houses, four houses, and nobody has anything. Uh, but uh, we're based, nobody talks about the intake of solar. It's 10,000 to one, right? And uh, one hour of solar would run the human race for a year if we collected it, sunlight. That's, that's generally, a, and the other except the fact is there's 190 feet of sea level rise frozen at the South Pole in the ice. There's 20 feet in Greenland, right? But 190 feet at the South. And if that, all bets are off when that starts to melt big time. One of the things, so there's no question it would be better if we got our energy from solar than, than the fossil fuels. There's no question. We're getting a little bit, but we're not getting that much. However, the idea, and this is this is a um, incorrect idea, is that we think of solar as being not having an infrastructure. The reality is we've got to have infrastructure just to make solar panels. We, you know, it incre uh, it requires things like lithium which is largely found in Bolivia and Chile, if I remember right. There's also some on the Western Shoshone Reservation in Nevada. But you've got to have lithium, you've got to have raw, raw materials. So you've got to extract a lot to even be able to make the, to make the, uh, uh, to, to, to make the solar panels. It's, the myth is that it's pretty, you know, free that we can move over right over and it can't. Here's another thing. We cannot produce as much energy via alternative. Say, if we could just snap our fingers and switch to alternative, we still could not produce as much energy as the fossil fuels. We're going to have to reduce, we're going to have to reduce our standard of living. We're going to have to cut that in any case. One of the things that I think a lot of the politicians do um, is that they want to come up with solutions where we don't have to change our lifestyles, that we can continue to drive, that we can fly around the world and stuff like that. We absolutely cannot. If we want to have a chance to keep that atmosphere intact, we've got to reduce, we've got to reduce our energy use. It's it's just there's no way you can have both. Wow, that's no, you that's so we're still in the first round of questions. Anyone have a question about NASA? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Tim O'Donnell. Hi, Tim. Um, it, from an educational perspective, you know, uh, Tom had just asked about um, is there a root cause that, that causes this problem? And it seems like I say, from an educational perspective, the very first thing you should do when trying to solve a problem is to be number one, aware of it, and number two, completely understand the right cause in order to solve it. Yeah. 
our last question because we've got to get to get. We're going to have to go to rebuttals pretty quick. If we're going to have time, so. Well, let me try it in. The question is, ideally, I totally agree with you. In a perfect world, that would be the world. We don't have that time. We know enough. We know way too much to not act. So I would rather act with maybe only 98% of the information waiting than waiting for that 100%. Well, we don't know that. We don't, what we do know, what we do know is that the, the uh, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is growing. Like I say, it's now 427 parts per million. Okay, we, we know that, but so we've got to find some way to act. So whatever solution that we come up with, and you may have the same thing, or you may have a different thing than I do, we've got to find a way to get that down. Science says, science says is that we, where we can get comfortable again is if we get it down to about 350 parts per million. We cannot stay where we're going, and we're only going one way, and that's up. Okay. At this point, we're going to have to. Uh, um, George, Charlie, and me have a quick. All right, we have to make it really, really quick. Well, we had a speaker here a couple of weeks ago and said that they can fit the population of the U.S. in the state of Illinois. I think you're fear-mongering with all these, uh, these uh, statements. Are, that you liberals are trying to destroy this country. Wait, wait, wait. Don't insult me. I'm not a liberal. I'm not a liberal. I'm not that conservative. Yes, I am. I'm against capitalism. Absolutely. I am not that conservative. What I'm saying, what I'm asking you, sir, is, is think about what I said. I think I think what I've presented is the most accurate information out there. I think it's coherent. I think it's, it comes together. I think it's it's something that, that is solid enough that it deserves the respect to at least consider. But you tell me how you're going to get every American into the state of Illinois. You ain't going to get it. It ain't happening. Charlie, ask your question, but make it quick, and then I'm going to ask one. All right, All right. Uh, Dr. Sipes. Uh, nowhere in your plan did I hear anything about what is what is termed carbon capture. There's a lot of greenhouse gases up there already. Methane lasts 10 years. And I didn't hear of any method to terraform the earth uh, to remove that Sorry. level. It's not going to happen. I, 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 I understand your question. Let me answer it since we're, we're short on time. The, the actual result, as far as I know, is there's been no carbon capture uh, uh, shown to work at any size of scale. It's just, it's, 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 a, it's basically a corporate subsidy right now. There's no evidence that it will work. And we have to develop it, if at all possible, okay. because we've got to suck that stuff out. That's got to be one of the solutions. But I mean, one of the things that we know is that when you're, when you're in a hole, the first thing to turn around is to stop digging. We've got to stop putting the greenhouse gas emissions on. Dr. Seitz, I gave a talk in December on how to terraform the earth. So I, I want to elaborate on something that Mike asked. Um, I heard a radio host say that we don't have to worry about carbon emissions because the trees absorb it and that's what they breathe and it allows us to live further north, like Mike said, in Siberia. Do you think there's something to that idea or do you think it's just oil, oil company propaganda? Uh, there's a certain amount of truth to it, but that's the basis of all propaganda is that they, they work off some little grain of truth and, and magnify it. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're deforesting the planet so that we're working against that. That's insane if you think that the, that's the planet, that, the, that, the, uh, uh, that that's going to solve the problem. But I won't say it's not, uh, has a, doesn't have a grain of truth. It, it does, but that's what we're working with. All right, I'm going to let you... Uh... Lead us into the rebuttals, explain how it works, and uh, let us know. We sit down, so you'll make the last comment. Charlie, you, no, you're going to explain it real quick. Um, I have never done this before. So, we're going to, uh, people can come up and criticize the speaker, or you can just give thoughts to illustrate, your, you know, to share your thoughts about it. whether you agree or disagree. 
Three, and we'll go one at a time. We're gonna do about, okay, we'll go about five minutes, depending on the number. You may have to call it back. Go ahead and sit down, we're gonna do rebuttals now. All right, Sid, you wanna send the microphone for him to rebut? And then we'll let you go next. Right, right, right. Um, all right, well, we'll, uh, we'll let, uh, we'll let George go first. I mean, we'll let, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, Jake, we're still here. Uh, who's got the first oh. rebuttal? All right, you got it, and then we'll do you, Sid. All right, George, go ahead. Nearly one in five Americans are maxed out on their credit cards. The nation's collective credit card balance stands at one $1.12 trillion, near a record high. The average card carries an interest rate of 21.6%, an, an all-time high. The average card balance is $6,360. Does that sound right? Mine's not that high. Uh, another all-time high at the end of 2023. The average interest rate has risen by seven full points since early 2022 from 14.6%. That's what mine was. And now it's almost 21.6%. If you have a card balance of $5,000 at an interest rate of 21.6% and pay 100 a month, you will spend, you, you will spend more than 10 years paying it off and you will spend $7,906 in interest on top of the 5,000. You can easily become trapped in a dangerous debt, debt cycle. Nearly half of all credit card holders pay the balance off every month. The interest rate doesn't matter if you pay the balance off at month's end. You will pay no interest if you pay the balance off at the month's end. I have a Chase Visa card. In order to avoid interest payments, you in, in order to avoid interest payments, you must pay the bill by the due date, the twenty second of the month with, with Chase. If you don't pay by the, the closing date, the twenty fifth of the month, you will be charged a late fee. The current balance due is posted on monthly statements. You must pay the exact amount to the penny to avoid interest charges. You can check your statement or your personal banker to get exact amount for that month. I think it's important to know your about this. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, Sid, you wanna? Okay, let, uh, let me hand the microphone to Sid. I'll, I'll hand the microphone to Sid. Yeah. Yes. yeah, Sid, go ahead and then we'll let you rebut next. And then we'll get back you back on the, we'll get you next day. Go ahead, Sid. At the end of World War II, um, what happened was being an expert who was in the Truman administration gave a speech to industrial, industrials, um, bankers, and people that ran this country. And what he told them was that Franklin Roosevelt, New Deal, stopped working about 1937. And the only way we got out of it that is, the Great Depression was by the, the Second World War. In order for the United States to exist at this present moment, present time, they have to have cons constant wars. Because when you have wars, Things are destroyed and they have to replace them right away. Right now, the United States is engaged in maybe five to seven wars. And that's the only way it could exist. 
And that's what the alcoholism really is. It's degenerated so far that the only way it could exist is through war. I'll buy that. Okay. Uh, all right, Tom, grab the mic and we'll take you back. And thanks a lot, Sid, for your rebuttal. Tom, you know what to do. And I appreciate you coming and speaking out a little bit. Just stick it right in that thing there and we'll be all set. Um, Kim, one part that I didn't hear you mention about the negative effects of fossil fuels is the devastating impact, which is that they cause 68,000 deadly disease that have been killing people and are killing people, um, cancer, heart disease, etc. So that point is really not brought up by climate change activists, but I think it's an important point because it's happening now. It's not a threat into the future. And maybe it would motivate people to care about it more and take action to change. Um, also, you said that it was incorrect that all 350 million citizens of the United States could live in Illinois, live in Illinois but mathematically there's about 1.6 trillion square feet in Illinois and there's about 100 million families who each use 10,000 square feet for their house and property assuming four people per household on average so if you multiply 100 million times 10,000 it comes to 1 trillion square feet of land used for residential and Illinois has 1.6 trillion square feet so mathematically you can do it no problem with room left over for growing food, making clothes, etc. cetera, um, using efficient technology. Why? Why would we do that? Why do you need everyone? Charlie, one, one for the time, go. please. Why? It, it's, it's just a thought exercise. It's not saying Charlie, that it's can we at least... it could be done. You build out, you use vertical space, you build more skyscraper to piss people more comfortably. All right. So thanks for a great presentation. You're hitting on everything I'm concerned about. Uh, I recently left the Libertarian Party to join the Greens. I still consider myself kind of in between. Uh, I like the Greens because they have a lot of environmental solutions. And I like the Libertarian Party because you and me, they're both concerned about the national debt. I agree with you that we should raise the poverty level, the poverty line. It's something Andrew Yang talked about. Um, and I understand why you're concerned about the Green New Deal and green capitalism and greenwashing. I just want to remind you the congressional and the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez version they don't have a plan to get rid of fossil fuels, but the Green Party and Howie Hawkins' version of the Green New Deal does have a plan. Uh, I'm still waiting to read those documents, so I'll try to learn more about it, update you in the future. And there's an idea called geo-libertarianism and geo-anarchism. So we need environmental reform, but we also need to recognize what Kim is saying about uh, that money and capitalism are part of the problem. So we have to have environmental reform and take steps towards moneyless society. I just published an article last night uh, on my blog based on what Tom O'Donnell taught me, 62 ways to wean yourself off of dependence on the US dollar money and currencies. And then we spread the awareness that people can live without money and then Ceasing to use money doesn't make you die because it's not one of your basic needs of survival. Food, air, and water, clothing, medicine, and shelter are, um, then we can solve the problem. Now, I don't mean to understate or dismiss the problem. It's a very serious problem, but there's no, you know, we got through a depression and two world wars. If we take a can do attitude and use all the resources at our disposal, we can do it. Now, the first question, I don't agree that income tax is a solution. Um, I, I draw a distinction between earned income made from wages. Um, and unearned income that's earned with the help of taxpayers and the government. So I would support taxing people who made their money through getting the government, like lobbying to get the government to give them favors and hand them our taxpayer money. So to that extent, I would support income tax. I imagine you probably agree with what I just said. And I support reforms and uh, making the Green Party and other environmentalists aware of two ways to refocus all our attention on the environment, which is the only way we're going to save the planet. And that's Georgism, the uh, single tax supported by Henry George, which would tax polluters, land hoarders, maybe landlords, um, and actually punish people for polluting and hoarding land instead of just taxing ordinary people's production. And uh, there's a, uh, also bioregionalism, which would make it so that mount, mountain ranges would be the new borders instead of all the lines. 
out a now then and okay, just trying to raise awareness of those things. I look forward to talking to them about that. It's Georgism and bioregionalism. And uh, you know, I understand why you're concerned about the national debt. Um, we need to stop asking how are we going to get out of debt and st start asking how soon do you want to get out, out of debt? We have $34 trillion. Like Jim said, it's just like a family budget but with more zeros. Just simplify it. We can pass a law saying that we have to have a surplus budget of $1 trillion per year, pay that directly into the hands of people who own us the money, and pay off $34 trillion over 34 years. Now, I'm not saying anything about how we're going to do that. I'm just saying that we have to do that for the next 34 years or we're pretty much doomed. And those countries are going to come back and invade us and try to get their money back. Um, I don't agree that too many types of cereal is an issue, but I do agree that we're being poisoned through the cereal. I don't really see production as the problem, but if you're talking about production of fossil fuels and unsustainable resources, that kind of production is definitely a problem. And um, Mike, I'm glad to call you my friend. You're a funny guy. You're a nice guy. But if you keep interrupting, I'm going to show up at your presentation next week, and I'm going to yell the word oil every five seconds. Okay. All right. I'm going to go. Next. Go ahead, Mike. All right. Yeah, you're all excited that my show next week. It'll be very interesting. Nice PowerPoint. Can you ready for that? Yeah. Yes, I will. I will be ready. PowerPoint. Sustainable transportation. Yeah. As we pointed out tonight, oil is the problem. Andy, I don't know why you keep on talking about windmills and solar, and they're not doing. You know, they're not being. They're everywhere. I think <laughs> Iowa, ninety-nine percent of Iowa's power comes from windmills now. So it's well on its way. When we're all dead and gone, there's going to be all kinds of ways to make power. Power meaning electricity, meaning what coal used to do. Boy, Tim, you cleaned up today. No, it's you just got my money there. So, um, okay, and then everybody still confuses all the fossil fuels and, and and things called energy. Okay, so oil is mostly for transportation. Let's reveal cars, trucks, planes. Boats, or ships, <laughs> most that's what oil is for, transportation. Natural gas is for heat and power also. Harmful is coal. Coal is being replaced by windmills and solar and geothermal and nuclear and all kinds of other energies when we're dead and gone you're going to be able to make power electricity for this and this and everything else so I, again i want to point out that oil 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 is the problem it's much different than coal it's much different <laughs> than natural gas so next week i'll be doing another show on Mostly alternative uh, transport and passenger uh, transportation and different modes that other countries use. Whereas we sit on our fat asses and cars and big pig trucks and stinky uh, SUVs all day here in America. So um, let's stop using the words fossil fuels and let's stop using the word energy because they're not all the same. They're all different products that get burned, and they're all different uses. So again, there's oil, there's natural gas, and there's coal. Oil is the problem. You cannot replace oil. You can replace coal. You can replace natural gas. You cannot. An airplane would fall out of the sky without oil. Billions of cars in America will stop <laughs> as soon as oil runs out. If we don't have oil wars, if we don't have cheap oil, if we don't have wars for oil, Bush Cheney spent five trillion dollars on oil wars. Obama spent fifteen trillion on bank and stockbroker bailouts. Trump gave five trillion dollars to the stockbrokers. Where's your thirty trillion were in debt? Oh, wait, Trump gave five trillion dollars tax breaks to all the rich people. That's why I immediately assume that because I know well, Trump's not my 
the guy either. So that's my thought on debt and oil and false news. And Andy, we're well on our way to getting rid of coal. Okay. All right, I'll let you next. I defer to the uh, all right. Okay. Remember, right, right. Oil. You know, and oil. yeah, hi, I'm oil. Ellen Corley, and uh, I like the free speech forum. I think the solution is free speech, freedom of the press, <laughs> academic freedom, scientific freedom. They all depend on truth and um, science and knowledge and the inductive method in addition to. There's inductive and deductive, and also adductive. Something I learned from Jim Fetzer, who is wrongly described as a conspiracy theorist, but uh, you know, he told me adductive. It means, you know, if you understand it, it's just we've got to look at things like he said critically, scientifically, and the scientifically means we're all scientists. Let's put our thoughts together and find the synthesis, you know, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That it could be used to divide us in the Hegelian way, or it could be used like the Platonic dialectical education method, which is to synthesize our, our understanding of the problem and, you know, identifying it and coming up with solutions. It, we have gotten worse at this, and it's because they, this evil Hegelian empire is, wants us to be divided into Fox News echo chamber versus MSNBC echo chamber or the misinformation one. And this is a threat to life on earth and civilization. It's being done deliberately, and that's the problem that we could stop through the media. I, I like the way Kim uh, mentioned that he's taught media. I taught the media in eighth grade. There was a 1985 to ninth graders. It was required in Georgia. Everybody teach it. That's one thing we need is a uniform educational standards and really free education, free lifetime education, but with standards based on truth. You know, we've gone the opposite way, right? We've Everything's been privatized and more affordable, less affordable, and, and the quality goes down because it, the, the professors are, and the scientists are, you know, all being put in by warmongering, you know, by the, by the supply side of the empire, you know, the invisible empire, the deep state. They, my stepfather's one of them. I had a front row seat to this. He co-founded the Manhattan Institute, this, right-wing free market uh, think tank with, you know, that was funded by the, by the British crown and Rothschild bankers, you know, um, they put in all this heritage foundation, American enterprise foundation, you know, and they, they just infiltrated the colleges with their billions and with this, they print fake news through the, through the city journal, you know, they are oh, profiling, Black people is okay, no problem there. Every issue of truth and justice, they take the other side. Why? Because it benefits the supply side and hurts the demand side. You know, the, it doesn't, the students, the consumers, the citizens, be damned. You know, they, they, there's a lot of money in just cutting off, you know, the waste that goes to us. You know, I... My stepfather treated me like that useless eater. You know, we are just useless eaters in their world. And they are running the world. And that's been their plan since the end of World War II. This is the Cold War. This was what it was all about. What it was supposed to be, we fight fascism. And, the, you know, the fascist type communism. But the truth is, the fascists were the ones that turned it around and said, fight Fight the poor people, fight the Palestinians, fight the communists, you know, and now, and then we're like, wait a minute, we're educated. We know that that's a lie. You know, I mean, Sandinistas and, you know, poor peasants in Vietnam and Indonesia, why are you slaughtering them? You know, millions of them, all right, around the world. Why are we doing that? Right, because um, they consider.
consider them first it was first it was communism then they made up the idea of terrorism you know they created isis al-qaeda you know right um hamas you know all of they created it was a false flag attack they didn't get 9 11 they didn't do the world trade center they didn't do october 7th those were false flag attacks there's tons of, of truthful documentaries on this the smartest people the corbett report but no they they wiped that out because they can control it i'd like to give a talk on july 11th which i could to update what i've learned about the prosecutor's management information system software that was stolen by rafi Eitan of the Mossad. you know 1981 the reagan's gave it to him and they have used it to basically infiltrate it's like the master key to the stock market to the treasuries to the banks to the to the hospitals they the main thing is the bank they control the bank of international settlements but the palantir is what they, they've said it's the ultimate weapon they put it into the ukraine now it's you know the 5g ai warfare they just they know what you know okay go kill that entire block because there's one one Hamas guy in there, you know, what? just wipe out the whole, uh, wipe out Gaza. Why? Because there is an oil field and a gas field right outside Gaza. They signed the contract on it October, the week before October 7th. This is called the Leviathan field. You know, when he talks about oil, you know, there wasn't that much oil in Iraq. They were expecting it in the Caspian Sea. When they found out that it's not in the Caspian Sea, they're like, okay, we're, you know, all holds bar. Let's just take over the whole world, total spectrum domination, because we're going to need the oil. And we got to get rid of seven eighths of the population. That's why they came up with the bio warfare, the vaccines, the viruses. Kill us all up. We're useless eaters. This is the truth. We, they are invisible Nazis, and we are, they call us bugs in a jar. You know, and laugh. That's what Rafi Tan said about his method. Um, he's the one that stole the promise software, and and it still has it. We got to take down the bad guys, and it's in Israel. It's in Netanyahu, and it's Biden and the Trump, the Democrats. Trump and Biden are both owned completely by Netanyahu. That's why he doesn't give a heck of what we say about whether he should stop the Holocaust in Gaza. It's horrifying. Okay, I'm going to go next. I have, I have been learning a few things over the last few months about some of our, uh, about some of our older philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, and a lot of these others. And I think what we're forgetting today is that we don't know how to think like some of them did. For example, in the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, when he poses a question, he then does and understands both sides. And then he goes and he tries to explain the views on both sides. Like, and then he tries to do a compromise in the middle. Plato and Aristotle were always one for questioning and, uh, trying to come up with a common answer based on the art form of discussion rather than just the platitudes and some of the things we see today. But I think the biggest thing that we're, that one of the reasons why we're seeing so much problems today is we're not, we're trying to blame our own problems on others, not only socially, but environmentally. We're trying to blame uh, some of our own behaviors on the corporations. We're trying to blame it on capitalism. We're trying to blame it on something else. And if we're not blaming it on that, we're blaming it on the others. You know, my question to all of you is, whatever happened to the problem of self-accountability? I mean, it used to be called sin. And it used to be called, we used to have a creator that we would, uh, you know, talk about and, and be accountable to. Did the atheists live by a moral code? All of us have some kind of moral code that we live up to and try to forget a lot of times. Saying that you know, is a direct 
to it that will work. And the thing is, I too have been examining this problem with global warming and uh, this problem with energy and everything else. And the only thing that I can see that dealing with on the horizons is uh, uh, a safer form of nuclear power, something called the molten salt thorium reactor. And I believe in it so much and I'll close with this. Oh, thorium, thorium, molten salt. Reactor. And if we build them, history will show it was the right way to go. Like I said, let us think. <laughs> All right, Charlie, you want to go or is there another rebutter? All right, Andy, go ahead. I believe Karina has Karina her hand Charlie. up. Karina has her hand up. Yeah, I know. I Put the you. microphone. Put the microphone in the snake, please. I will do it, Charlie. Well, let, let Karina go then. You want to go real quick? Um, Karina, you want to go? Yeah, your hands okay, up. okay. Um, I wanted to explain my question because it may have uh, seemed a bit out of left field to ask about whether population increase or de decrease is a good or bad thing. Uh, but, um, okay, so what happens is that I get confused because I listen to the media and then they talk about many of the issues that were brought up today concerning uh, a shortage of fresh water, massive issues with pollution, uh, climate change, effects of climate change, um, uh, in, and and then the next story is, oh my gosh, there is a population collapse. Uh, how is this country or civilization going to survive? Um, and it is actually the law. I, I agree with the speaker to say it's not just how many people it, you should look more at consumption than look at just the number of people. But today, right now, what's been happening is the countries that are the highest consumers are the ones with, with the um, plummeting uh, uh, birth rates uh, and, and that, that are, are seeing a population decrease. Now, the United States is an exception, partly because we have a, uh, immigration, uh, but among a lot of native born uh, people in the United States, they're, they're, without immigration, I believe we would be having a shrinking population. Uh, but um, um, anyway, it's, it, it's interesting to me how, how population would factor into uh, the issue of, of climate change and our consumption and our use of fossil fuels. That's it. All right, Karina. Uh, Charlie, you want to go then? Or, 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 or thank Charlie. Why am I next? Charlie, go ahead. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Sipes for a very interesting presentation. I will cover very five areas. First of all, in answer to Karina. I don't really understand what the issue is. If there are less people, there's less demand for energy and less demands on the environment. So obviously, fewer people is positive in terms of from an ecological perspective. Why is this? I, I don't understand what the issue is. If you have fewer animals within the forest, there's less demands upon that forest. Number two. It also eludes me as to why having everybody living in close proximity is somehow beneficial ecologically. A lot of people living close together use as much energy as a lot of people living far apart. So I don't understand, again, what that has to do with ecology or the environment. Wherever the people are, they're going to be using energy. And where do you get that energy? Like Andy's talking about. He says use sunlight. All right, that's one of two. Number three, um, 
in answer to the speaker here, every Green New Deal uh, incorporates regulation. It says we have to terminate doing things that produce greenhouse gases. Makes absolute sense. Now you can look at particular activities that result in the production of greenhouse gases and quite logically say, let's not do that. An example would be, there are 10 million new cars produced every year. It's probably a good idea to say for the next four years, we will not be producing any automobiles. Frankly, perfectly good sense, you know. But um, now the other thing is, you've got to take some positive action towards reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we have produced. And that means, as I gave a talk on terraformation, you can achieve this by in different ways, by increasing the number of, we've gotten rid of all the trees. You've got to restore the temperate forest. You have to restore the tropical forest. You have to uh, expand the number of wetlands. Uh, and you also have to look at the land and how you're cultivating it. There's a amount of acreage. So it's all focusing on the terrain, the terra, the earth. So that's what I mean. I, I gave this talk in December. You've got to do something to proactively, like I said, expand the amount of soil in which plants would grow and capture gases. And it doesn't involve any regulation whatsoever. I don't have to impose any standards on anybody. You can go on doing whatever you want, producing as much as you want, but we deal with the, somebody mentioned there, if you have a problem, work on the solution. And we all know about carbon capture, and I'm not altogether certain this is a low consumption lifestyle solution, uh, which I'm not certain is ever going to be enforceable or implementation. The only other things I'd like to ask is, uh, please keep in mind, probably all the figures here of that we've heard, the temperature of the ocean is the one you want to look at. It's the best indication. Don't worry about flooding and all that. It's the temperature of the ocean increasing or decreasing. And last of all, there was something about earthquakes. Fracking is a process which has been known to cause earthquakes. This is on the onset. It's happening in a terrible fashion in states like Oklahoma, where there was extensive fracking. That's the only place that climate change has shown itself. And last of all, one solution, petroleum, petroleum, pro, you have to decrease all activities that require the use of energy. Not just, if that involves petroleum, reduce and cut those out, but it's all activities that require the use of energy should be looked at and examined and are using clean energy or other, if you're not using clean energy to engage in those activities, then cease using it. So yes, activities that involve the use of petroleum, but we do all sorts of things to maintain our standard of living that requires the use of energy. Products are made using energy in all sorts of fashion. Anyhow, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Sipes. Good talk. Please come again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you are, Andy. The first thing I would mention, uh, hello out there. Oops, hold on. Sorry, Andy. Go ahead. So I don't run over. Mark this date on your calendar. I agree with virtually everything Charlie just said. It made a lot of sense. Ah. So Charlie's on the right track too. Uh, I read one of the websites uh, talking about maybe the Yale Climate Connection said that this last in 2023 in the last year, the total solar voltaic output of the world has surpassed 
the output of the entire global nuts for solar are coming in at one tenth to one twentieth the cost of any new nuclear plant, and it's global. The solar industry is huge. Okay. We know how to make houses without furnaces with $10 month heating bills or even lower. They're right here in Schaumburg and all Wisconsin has a builder that builds one watt houses, one watt per square foot of living space. No furnace. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute has been counseling builders how to build high rise buildings with no heating systems, no fossil fuel needed. You use proper insulation, proper window glass, proper solar control sheets, ventilation. And with proper solar control, uh, a lot can be done. Cutting down consumption is a primary. Uh, my thought is I'm giving, I'm cleaning out storage lockers and stuff we had and never used in our business. We're donating it to Goodwill, Salvation Army. We're not throwing stuff in the dumpster. We could cut our consumption nationally in half if people would donate to other people that need something rather than buy a new one and throw it away. You know, is that pretty much along with what you were thinking of? You know, cut, cut consumption by at least half. In America, no, nobody commented on this. We have a billionaire predator problem. And uh, as a, one, one owner of Walmart said, I'm not secure yet. My family's not secure because I got to put two kids through college. I have a wife who likes to shop and I only got 22 billion in the bank. I need another 30, 40 billion and then we'll be secure. That's a mental illness. I and mean, we've got two or 300 of those people that have that kind of mental illness and they own and operate the military industrial complex. I got out of Vietnam in 1968. When I got out, I've read, read everything I get my hands on since then because I realized I didn't know it then, but I know now I was part of the largest killing machine on the planet. Environmentally, killing people, killing the environment, pollution. The U.S. military is number one. And we haven't been fighting for freedom and justice anywhere since World War II, right? Pretty much. We could go a long way toward uh, solving the, this crisis if we... Other countries are switching over to small electric vehicles, like uh, three-wheelers, two-wheelers. There's been a revolution in batteries and compact motors, uh, the model airplanes have a two horsepower motor the size of your fist, weighs a pound. And uh, this kind of technology can cut consumption and material usage by an order of magnitude, like the house out Rocky Mountain Institute built in Colorado, 3,000 square foot house, no heating bill and $5 a month electric bill for that place. It was built in 1984. Here's a book uh, I wanted to mention, you know, those of you that heard my talks, I condense books. We call it database translation. We'll take five or 10 books on a subject, condense it down into a, a one page cliff notes. Well, I've read a lot of books. I'm familiar with almost everything that, uh, you know, Dr. Seitz talked about tonight. So I, I can tell you that the information he gave you on virtually everything we talked about is very high credibility not somebody from Fox News with an opinion. This book here is called Blue Gold. A lot of people don't, that's water. Blue, the next gold rush is water when they get out of oil. Left the White House. Before he left, they quietly bought 98,000 acres of land in a corner of Paraguay. Did you hear about that? That's uh, one of the world's largest sources of fresh water remaining. So the Bush family is planning on going into the water business because they can't figure out how to charge us for air. If they could have been, if they could charge us for air, you pay or you die, we'd be paying for air to the billionaires. But now we're going to be paying for water. There, for those of you that are interested, this book, the climate book, uh, edited by Greta Thunberg has uh, many credible scientists talked about a lot of the points. Have you seen this book? Are you aware of it? This is one of the best books of my, of my top 10. This would be one of the best books. It's called The Climate Book by Greta Thunberg. It's just... It's 
it's like ten encyclopedias. All you know, when you're still on order, it's a bestseller. It's called the brainwashing of my dad, written by Jen Senko. She tells the story of what happened to her dad when she, he he retired and started watching Fox News, and he became an ugly American, much like Trump. And, and then they 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 reprogrammed the remote when he wasn't looking, so he couldn't tune Fox anymore. And she said after a couple months of, of watching the other channels, he came back to his normal, loving, caring self. You know, Fox News is a cancer on American society. And, and that's where we are. Also, we'll, we'll talk about this in the future, but there's 190 feet of sea level rise that hasn't risen yet because it's frozen in the Arctic. And those big glaciers uh, are down there are melting. And um, it, let's see, when he, he talked about our speaker talked about tipping points. Well, it's like seeing a hill that you would have started a mile away. Well, by the time you can see that, if it's dark outside, you can see that thing is way too late to do anything about it. It's like a giant snowball roll. Going down the hill. Once it gets big enough, you can't stop it. And that's the essence. This is why our computer models have been wrong every year on science. They're admitting that. Our computer models are wrong. The press said, oh, the models are wrong, models are wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, yeah, they had the essence of it right, but the computer models were projecting this stuff happening far in the future. Things that they thought were going to be happening in 2100, 76 years from now. Is happening now in the form of ice, you know, thawing in the ocean, temperature. We just passed in some trees, they passed 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade or, you know, for uh, the temperature. And uh, like the, the sea levels don't have to come up much to wipe out the coastal cities because you got hurricanes and flooding. If, you're, if your city, like what happened in uh, Houston, they were under four feet of water down there in many places, right? If, if that happens every two or three years, it doesn't matter if the sea level rises much. You still can't build and rebuild there. So our, our 70, you know, I was going to yell it out, but I didn't. 70% the, the consensus is about 70% of the global population lives near coastal cities. About, so if, if Miami goes underwater or you can't live in, on the southern coast, where do you think those people are going to be coming? They're going to be coming to higher ground here. Um, and, you know, Illinois is not going to be that much fun if we're going to be having three or four or five million ugly Americans coming here. Trumpers have thought, well, uh, you know, we, we don't have to do anything about climate change. So there we are. And, and we, need, we need to do something to wake up a third of the country that's living okay. in total mythology. And we need to do something to wake up the rest of the country to think, so, oh, we can continue our standard of living the way it is. And we don't have to do anything until it gets really bad. Well, when it gets really bad, it's over. Okay. And then it'll just go downhill from there. There won't be anything to do with the survival of the fittest. There's already websites that tell you how to survive after the grid goes down. Electric, no no okay. electricity in America for two years. That's all what right. they're projecting with uh, cyber attacks. It's all, you know, Used to be science fiction. Now we're looking that in the face. I'm talking about building nuclear power plants everywhere. You can eliminate one of those things with a 357 magnet. You shoot some bullet, bullets into the transformers, you black out a state, two states, three states. And that's common knowledge among people who work for ComEd and the other power companies. So okay. thank you for the talk you gave tonight. I hope it spreads. Okay. Thank you all. Our, are we done with rebuttals? Yes, we are. All right, so Dr. Sipes is going to provide his last thoughts. And if you don't mind, feel free to weigh in on nuclear power, your views on nuclear power, and let us know if you want to talk about your posters. Okay. All right. First of all, I want to thank you all for listening and engaging. Um, obviously, some of the stuff struck you, and I, and I, I appreciate the attention that you gave uh, to my thoughts. Um, and I hope you'll keep thinking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the one of the issues that well, there's several issues that I think we have to talk. About. First of all, 
we cannot consume. We got to, we got to cut that drastically. We we do that is just that is just something we've got to do. But we've also got we've also got to cut cut the war machine. We're spending you know we're spending almost a trillion dollars a year for the war machine, if not more. Yeah, when you add everything in, um, these are serious things. I think if you want to get down to it even further, somebody asked the question earlier. Uh, I think one of the things is that we've been taught to be passive. We've been trained to be taught, trained to be passive. And think about this. All of us in here, at least as I can see, most of the same way, we're here, we're around during the Vietnam War. That was an amazing thing that the American people rose up. Now, first of all, let's be clear, the Vietnamese were decided to have their, their independence of freedom, and they were willing to pay any cost. Uh, the latest figures I've seen are 3.7 um, million Vietnamese were killed, and another, let's see, uh, another 5.7 were wounded. That puts us on the level of the Holocaust. Okay. Um, you know, so, yeah, actually, it's, all, it's above it. The point I'm trying to say is, is that the United States came together, people came together when they, as they learned about the war. And, and there's a debate about what impact the left or the anti-war movement, the left, whatever, uh, had an impact on. But as somebody who was in the military during the time, what I saw was that we learned from the anti-war movement. And so by the end of the war, the U.S. had to pull out of Vietnam because our troops would refuse to fight. There's a wonderful movie. If you haven't seen it, it's called Sir No Sir. Every American should see this film. <laughs> Sir No Sir. Yes, I are. Uh, it talks about the anti-war movement inside the U.S. military. Now, I was part of it. I participated in it. I was in a major figure. Nobody knows my name type of thing. But I was involved in, 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 in fighting Marine Corps from within. I, that's where I got politicized in the Marine Corps. Not, not the usual story, but it was there and it was important. Since then, we have been consciously taught not to think. To sit back, let the politicians solve the problem. We've got to break that, folks, because these people are not going to do it. And one of the things that in, in comments that I didn't hear. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I didn't hear that we need to talk about is there's a bunch of people that totally disagree with us that are working to do everything they can to extract the last bit of oil or the last bit of whatever out of the world. And they don't want us to get together. They don't want us to think about this stuff. They want us to drink the Fox News Kool-Aid. Um, and they're happy about it. They've bought off our politicians. There's not a, you know, uh, the idea of politicians serving the people. That's such a, such a, a joke anymore. We've got to find ways to change this where the ordinary people say, no, we're not going to do this. And one of the things is, I had, um, Joe, there was a lot I could, could respond to. We've talked for hours on, on, on some of the stuff we brought up. I'm a, I'm a long time bioregionalist and stuff like that. Um, but I think one of the things that the, that the left has been too complacent about, and I'm using that term very broadly, so excuse me, and that is that if we you just get the right people in, everything will be solved. And that's not true. We've seen a lot of good people go in, they get corrupt, they get bought off, stuff like that. We do have to use the political system while we've got the freedom. I think one of the things about the American system is that when Americans get off, the, off our asses, together we can change the world. The point is to get off our asses, and that means we've got to get together with people, We've got to find like-minded people to, to get together with, to build an organization, because it's not just enough to, buy, to, to get good candidates in there. You've got to be able to force them to do what you want them to do afterwards. We've got to learn how to organize. And when you think about it, though, that's one of the things we do naturally. Who hasn't organized a, a birthday party for your kids or grandkids? We all know how to organize. You call people up and say, let's get together. 
I do that, I think we've got to get away from this idea. Of, I don't think a, a monocausal, one thing causing everything is, is what's really happening. I think it's a combination of things. I think we learn, we need to learn to have nuance and, and see both good and bad in things. Um, but we've got to find, find ways to get together to change the country and the world. We're not going to change it separate from people a, a, around the world. You can't think of changing the U.S., but not Europe, not Vietnam, not China, whatever. We're in this together. And one of the lies that we get, we keep getting told is how the Chinese are going to invade us. There's been a lot of shit about that lately. Or the Russian folks, look, D-Day, the anniversary just passed, was across a 20-mile stretch of water. D-Day almost failed. Now, you're telling me people are going to come from thousands of miles away through water controlled by the greatest naval force in the history of the world, and they're going to get here, and then they're going to meet a bunch of crazy Americans that have more damn guns than we have people, and they're going to do that because they have nothing but it's just insane that that any adult would talk would have got to would got to come together and just say that's nonsense. They use terrorism. They do. They do all that. You know, there's all kinds of things. But what I'm trying to say is, there are people that don't want us to do what we're doing in places like this. So I want to. I want to thank you for coming. I want to. Wanna, I hope I've given you a few things to talk about or to think about. Um, Any thanks for your 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 comments on it. You agree with a lot of the stuff that I say, but but thank you all. I've enjoyed it, and I wish you well. And let's give our speaker another rousing round of applause. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Very good. Wait a minute, Andy, hang on a sec. Yes. The old English law, if you're silent about something, it means you're okay with it. We weren't silent during the Vietnam War. A country rose up and said, enough is enough. This is unacceptable. Yeah, right now, people now. back are sitting silent because they've been, we've been silenced by propaganda, a flood of propaganda 24-7 from Fox News and the others. That's what's different. We have to stand up and confront everybody that thinks everything's okay. Can't be silent anymore. We only got a few months left. Thank you. Thank you so much. With, with that... We thank you guys very much for attending, and the college is officially adjourned. Very good. We got all the solutions.